uh, as I already mentioned in class, uh, the history of education is much broader than just the history of school, the history of schooling. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to uh, illustrate that particular point uh, of view. Professor Jane Buckingham, uh, she comes from uh, Canterbury, uh, which is not only located uh, in England, uh, I recently discovered that there is also a town called Canterbury in New Zealand, uh, and that is where Professor uh, <laughs> Buckingham uh, actually is coming from, so that was a, a bit of a mistake of mine. So that makes me even more uh, grateful for her being here. Uh, she is widely recognized as an expert in the history uh, of leprosy, and in, for example in 2002 she published uh, a wonderful book uh, which listens to the title uh, Leprosy in Colonial South India, <laughs> Medicine and Confinement. Uh, and today she is going to present to us challenging the stigma of leprosy disability again in a colonial context uh, but now the colonial South uh, Pacific. So it's my pleasure to give uh, the floor to Professor uh, Buckingham. Thank you. Well, it's my great uh, pleasure and great privilege to be here. Uh, one of my colleagues had commented that perhaps um, it would be a bit of a shock when, um, when Pieter re realized which part of the world I was actually coming from. And uh, when I mentioned that it was going to be a 30-hour trip, <laughs> I think it was a bit of a, a surprise. But anyway, so I've come from the South South Pacific region um, from New Zealand and uh, from the University of Canterbury which is in Christchurch um, an area that was damaged very badly by earthquakes um, a couple of a few years ago now so I've come from there and my research is based is based on this Pacific region and on the relationship between uh, New Zealand the country that I now live in though I'm actually Australian um, between New Zealand and the Pacific region and the way this relationship has developed um, through a kind of philanthropic connection between New Zealand and the South Pacific. So, I'll start. So the first thing I must do is give my sincere thanks to GRIP, uh, to the Damien Fund, uh, to the Doctoral Studies Section of Humanities and the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences at KU Leuven and also of course to Peter Verstrade um, who has done so much to bring me here and to e Evelyn who has disappeared. Um, so many thanks to you for what's been a very interesting and exciting trip so far. So when I was looking at this uh, I'll switch because I can't help walking around. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about how to present something that would mean something to you um, but would also be a new experience, a new side of a new sort of research experience. So the work I'm presenting is actually part of a research project called Community in Isolation. And this project has been going since 2008 and it focuses on a particular island in Fiji. In Fiji is an archipelago, a group of islands. It's a very volcanic area, so these are some of the sort of islands that popped up out of the ocean after volcanic activity. And one of these islands was set aside in 1911 as a place for the isolation and treatment of people with leprosy from the whole Pacific region. And we often hear about islands that are used for isolation. There's the island of, um, uh, uh, just thinking, of Molokai, which is very much part of your history, the history of Father Damien and the history of leprosy in New Zealand. So this project is focusing on this particular island. And this is, if you have a look at this map, you get a sense of the placement of it. Um, it's a tiny place. You have to travel, when you get to Suva, you have to travel from Suva to Korovolo, then take a boat across to Ovalau, then from Ovalau you take another boat out to Mahungai. So it's a little island, quite, quite isolated. And also, if you see these blue lines, these represent reefs. 
you know what a reef is? Yeah. So it's, a, it's extremely dangerous, actually, to get there. It's a very difficult trip. Um, and it's sort of two buses and two boats now. It was even more difficult before. So it's quite isolated um, from the main area of Fiji, Vitilevu, um, and really from the whole of this Fijian <coughs> region. But this cluster of islands is just one section of the Pacific, which is a massive ocean. And there are huge island groups all scattered all around this region. And ultimately, the people who came to Makungai came from all these different island groups. So it becomes a kind of focus point in the Pacific for people with leprosy and as a result for disability and for people with particular disabilities related to leprosy. This is to give you some sense of the island. It's actually a very beautiful place. I've been there. This is a photo from the 1930s. And you can see in this region, all the buildings down here are related to the hospital care of patients. Up on the hills, the Europeans have their houses. Um, and then around the, around the island, if you go sort of around uh, to, the, to the west and to the east of the island, and I'll show you a map in a minute, there are little villages set up in all these areas where the people with leprosy lived. And they lived in their villages according to the island group that they came from. So the Samoans lived in the Samoan village, Solomon Islanders in their villages, and so on. You can see here a bit of a map showing how these villages are set up. So here you have um, the patients area of the centre, you have where the Europeans live, high. You have the Indians, quite separate. These groups, the Chinese and the Solomonese, tended to be seen as a bit of outside, uh, sort of outsiders from the wider Pacific region. Here you have the Fijians, Tonga, Gilbertese, Cook Islanders, and Samoan. So the major island groups have their own villages here. So this area is set up to. <coughs> bring people from different parts of the Pacific together in a context in which they will be treated. These are the <coughs> remnants of the leprosy hospitals. And also in a place where they can live relatively normal lives. So, if we think about leprosy, this is the island now. And you can see here the beauty of the island. It's extremely rich. Uh, it's full of fruit and uh, there's abundant food, there's fresh water, there's good fishing. And the people who we interviewed as part of this project always talked about how incredibly beautiful it was and how much they loved uh, actually living in this area. So I'll talk a little bit about leprosy now <coughs> and the way that leprosy connects with disability because we don't always connect the two. Uh, increasingly, connection is starting to be made and understanding that that disability is not just about whether you have an impairment, a physical or, or a mental impairment, but that disability is also about the social response to that person. So when I'm talking about disability, I'm thinking main, mainly about the social uh, and cultural response to the person who has some difference, some physical or mental difference, which I'll term an impairment for the sake of this talk. So leprosy is increasingly being understood in terms of disability, primarily because of its stigmatization. So that people become stigmatized because of their disease, and therefore they become disabled within the society. They're separated from the society. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there's a disconnect. A person who has uh, the disease itself is enough to s disable them, enough to separate them, enough to stigmatize them. But then when you look at what happens to people with leprosy, uh, and nowadays we don't see much that's untreated, now it's treatable, but there were also impairments that go with the disease. Loss of toes, oh, sorry, loss of fingers, loss of toes, loss of eyesight, um, voice is very affected, collapse of the nasal cavity, of physical changes in the face, uh, in the body, which also can be seen as signs of physical impairment and as such are also a form
forms of uh, contexts in which a disability can occur. So leprosy can be understood as a disabling disease in two ways, because of the stigma instantly creates a kind of disability. So that somebody may look perfectly, I mean if I walked into a room and said, you know I've just been diagnosed with leprosy, I think the room would empty in a minute. Okay, because there's an anxiety about the disease. So it has a sort of social impact before the changes to the body, before the changes to the face and the physical changes start to manifest. And those changes are changes related to physical impairment. So it has two four, two elements of disability linked to it. So I'll just read a little bit just to kind of connect up what I've just said. So leprosy disables both in the material sense of damaging the limbs, the sight and the speech of those affected, and in the social sense of stimulating the disability of stigmatization. In colonial contexts, you think about this and you take a colonial context, so you add another layer of, of interpretation, another layer of analysis. In colonial contexts, the dynamics of race and power add further layers of subordination to people who are already marginalised by the disease of leprosy and its physical manifestation. Okay? So when we look at Fiji, we have a place which is under the colonial authority of the British at the time that we were looking at it. And you have another layer of subordination that adds, is added by this colonial relationship. Now in this in this talk, I'm focusing on images of leprosy affected people in the 20th century British colonial Fiji. So it's colonial Fiji, not Fiji now, uh, but during the colonial period. And images are used a lot, and I'm using images because it's a film festival, <laughs> but also to make the point that that often it's not what people said, but it was the images, the representations, as Pieter has already mentioned, the representations <coughs> of disability, which were so critical in shaping the responses to the disease, medical responses, government responses, social responses. And they were used <coughs> to educate, educate medical specialists, not that I've included that here, but um, you know, the simple photographs of the disease were used. Um, but they were also ed used to educate the wider public. And here in this particular talk, I want to focus more on the way that images are used, particularly in New Zealand, by the Leprosy Trust Board, who were trying to raise funds to support and give comfort, to give uh, material welfare, to give education, to give uh, entertainment to the people who are on this island. They used images in a particular way. And the way that's significant, the thing that's significant about their use of images is that in some ways they use the horror images to sort of attract attention, but most of the orientation of their image use is to normalize people with leprosy and to reduce the stigmatization. So the primary focus was on removing, reducing the effect of stigma, reducing the disabling effect of stigma by concentrating on a connection between non-leprous people and leprous people. So the, the way this fundraising was typically done was to show the relationship between the New Zealander, the white European in New Zealand, it doesn't include much Māori references, and that's another story. The relationship between these guys and between the people with leprosy on the islands. And they often refer to the people on Mahumai as our leper friends. So there's a deliberate effort to destigmatize and to reduce the disability of the disease itself. <clears throat> Is there any questions? Are you clear with what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Now this centre remained open till 1969, so it's got a very recent history. And as part of our project, we interviewed about 30 people who um, had been through this experience. Very interesting series of interviews. 
<clears throat> and until its closure, there are a lot of images collected from Mapungo, including photograph albums, for example, which the nursing sisters who looked after them, mainly uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic sisters, kept as a way of sort of recording their experience. Because for the sisters, these leprosy patients, particularly the children, became their family and became their home. The sisters were isolated on the island with them, um, and they became part of their sort of life. Occasionally they could leave on furlough, but mainly they lived with the leprosy patients. Also, there are a lot of photographs that um, become part of the New Zealand press. They go and become published in newspapers and also in the Fijian press. So that these photographs and images become part of a broader Pacific awareness of leprosy. But the images promoted by this New Zealand-based charity, the Lepers Trust Board, they played a major role in the visual construction of the leper, and I'm using it in the historical context, the visual construction of the leper in Fiji and New Zealand. So we have a colonial construction going on as well. And these images represent Leprosy affected persons as a focus of medical attention, a focus of charitable investment, an object of pity and horror. But they also represent a deliberate process of intervention and normalisation. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Alright, just to show you some images now. So this is the island now, and I've showed you a little bit of how it's set up. One of the things to be aware of is that on this island, people went there expecting to die there. They often went as children. Um, in 1911, when the island was set up, there was no known cure for leprosy. Uh, Chalmukra oil was the primary treatment. So people went there expecting it to be their home forever. And as a result, um, and because of the way it was set up, life, the, Life on the island was try. There was an effort to make it as ordinary as possible, as close to ordinary life as possible. So here we have. This is uh, one of the guys when I went out to the island. This is the ruins of a little Hindu temple, which was near the Indian village uh, here on the uh, west side of the island. Sorry, on the east side of the island. Oh, well, actually, I don't know which side it is. On one of the sides of the island. <laughs> okay, looking at this, it's the south. So this is, this is a Hindu uh, temple just near the Indians' um, community. But they may be living there for all their lives, but because of the fear of children getting leprosy, men and women were kept separate. So it was, it was normalized, but not normal. <coughs> so women stayed in their own compound on Lakumai, and instead of being separated according to um, the island origins, all the women stayed together. So they're all in one community, just close to the sisters. Now why was this? One of, it, one of the reasons was this concern that if children were born, they may catch the disease. And at that time, the way to manage transmission was to remove the children at birth. And it was a terrible thing to do, and the nuns didn't want to do it. So there was an active effort to keep people separate. Um, so there was a sort of... The other reason for it was that there was a sort of hope, even at the beginning, that people would be able to go home. So that if the wives and, and daughters of families in the Pacific could say, well, you know, we've lived in this community, but we haven't been living with a man, you know, we've kept separate. That meant they had a better chance of returning to their own husbands or their own families and getting married when they got home. So there was a very strong, very strong Methodist culture in the Samoan, uh, sorry, in the Tongan communities. Different Pacific communities had their own religious orientations, and most of them were very strict forms of Christian um, belief, which included a strict morality. So this segregation was not, it wasn't a totally alien concept. And the segregation was done partly to make sure that the reputation of the place was supported. Otherwise, 
Mapungai would have been represented as some kind of, you know, place where everyone, you know, everyone it was a free for all, um, and that once someone had gone there, their reputation was ruined. So this is one of the reasons for the segregation. <coughs> So, there was a persistent effort, um, as I've said, to bring some normalization. And, I'll just go back here, despite this sort of, you wouldn't think so looking at this. These represent, these images, particularly that of the Central Leprosy Hospital, represent another side, too, to this disabling project that's going on here. When I talk about disabling disease, I mean that the environment of Makumai is set up to remove the disability of the disease, the stigma which made those people socially isolated. It also was intended to disable the disease in a very material way, to make the disease no longer functional. And that was done with the hospital that you can see here. This, the hospital area was um, an extremely sophisticated hospital. It had the best equipment and the most up-to-date techniques of treatment available at the time. So this was not a dumping ground. This is not Molokai. Molokai and Father Damien's experience is completely different from this. This is a state-of-the-art facility. So the idea was to provide a healthy kind of lifestyle, um, good treatment, good food, and in that way to help um, improve people's health and well-being and, and destabilise the disease, disable the disease's effectiveness. But it was also intended to remove from the sort of psychological framework of people who came there the notion that they were somehow stigmatised. Because on an island like Makungai, Leprosy was the norm. So the stigmatization couldn't really function when you have leprosy as the norm. If you have a whole community of people with the disease, then their condition becomes normalized. So you have multiple forms of, of disability occurring in this context. Very strategic and very deliberate efforts to disable that disease and in doing so to make a person with leprosy not, not a, a strange isolated individual but to make them part of a community represented as something that's part of a community. Now I wanted to show you this very curious, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a second, it's a section from a newsreel called Pacific Magazine and it's built in the 1950s and it draws on a mi mixture of contemporary and historic footage but what it does is show how pervasive this notion of Makungai as a good place, a place where leprosy is no longer a stigmatised, horrible disease, where, it's, where people can be cured and healed. These sorts of notions come very strongly through this newsreel. And it, it, it shows a visit by very healthy New Zealand airmen. I've only shown a small section, but the beginning of this uh, newsreel, you have the... The, the plane flying in and these very, you know, athletic looking young men leaping off with big smiles on their faces and jumping off into this island full of leprosy patients. This is inconceivable. If you really think about it, it's, it's really quite an inconceivable idea. Only about 20, 30 years before. But Makungai has developed, been able to project, project this image and representation of itself through the media. Um, through the fact that people were cured or healed on the island, which is quite incredible, um, just with good nursing. There was no treatment, really. So this is a way, it shows sort of the way Makungai had become seen as a kind of beacon of hope by the 1950s. And I'll just play this. Well, there was nothing from the fight of the figure of leprosy. And over the last few years, the use of Solvacone has screened the rate of leprosy cures. Not least informed among the treatments given on Makanai is occupational therapy, which takes a practical form so the level of twin cures can become useful members of the island's ministry. No longer outcast, the levels can return to their homes as skilled carpenters, boat builders, electricians, and mechanics. 
shows an extraordinarily uh, positive representation of um, the disease. And what you can see here is these, these ladies with very restricted peripheral vision are the, the religious nuns who were looking after these patients. This is the queue for dressings. Um, people were dressed every morning. Their wounds and that were fixed up. And this film is made after sulfone drugs, so dapsone has become increasingly used and leprosy is starting to be seen as something that can actually be cured. One of the, um, the major development in leprosy treatment was dapsone, the development of a form of antibiotic which cured the disease. So this film is coming from that sort of expectation that treatment and cure could happen, but it follows a much bigger history and you could see in it, if you look at those films, you could see nobody there's no really clear image of somebody with advanced leprosy. There's not one representation there that's frightening. You have children playing. You have airmen who are strong and healthy and they're watching these children playing. They're having a lovely time. Um, it is an extremely normalized representation. And including in this is the notion that you have um, occupational therapy as part of treatment. Now, occupational therapy is not so much represented here as a way of healing the disease, but interestingly, it's presented as a way of preparing the leprosy patient to be a useful citizen, a useful member of the community when they go home. So you have a dis the disease is disabled, it's removed, the patients are no longer stigmatized, but they're on their way to citizenship. There's a kind of return to a normality, but even a more useful, they're, they're going to be useful people. So there's a great emphasis on the transformation of the leprosy patient. They're described as no longer outcasts. And this, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of ravingly optimistic uh, representation, but it's the result of a prolonged promotion campaign for about, of about 30 to 40 years, which shows constantly represents Makungai in this way. So that the people who have a disability, um, they're not seen as physically disabled, they're not even seen as particularly um, unusual. Um, what's coming, starting to come through is more the die of the language of colonialism, the idea to create the idea of making citizens out of a people who've been marginalised. That becomes stronger than the language of outcast and stigma. And they mentioned there New Zealand, and, and one of the points I'd like to raise here is just something, there's a couple of slides on New Zealand's connection with leprosy. They're talking about a voluntary initiative um, set up by Benjamin Pratt. 
um, initially to support people who had leprosy in New Zealand, and these are the people who were isolated in Littleton Harbour. Um, this is the origin of it. And then Patrick Toomey becomes this person who represents himself as the leper man. Um, the man who is going to fight for the leprosy patients of the Pacific, who will um, encourage donations, who will gather together the New Zealand public to send donations and to make um, all the efforts they can to make life pleasant and manageable for people on the islands. And Patrick Toomey gets known as the leper man and, and a comment is made that instead of you know, rejecting the title, he revels in it. And it's a curious, again, it's like saying, I can't think of anything that's really quite as stigmatizing now as it was there, but it's, 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 um, it, it's taking on a mantle which is uh, stigmatizing, but by taking it on, he's saying, I'm just the same. I'm a leper man myself, though I'm perfectly fine. I'm a leper man. And he uses this as a way of developing the connection between New Zealand and these Pacific communities. So I think, um, just looking at the clock here, um, we'll just kind of, rather than showing you that image, we'll, we'll push on a little more. So, when we start to look at the kinds of representation, um, those, that little bit of film reel I showed you, although it was for public consumption, it was part of a sort of news story, you know, CNN news story, not quite CNN, but it's a news magazine story. It was not really there to raise funds. And if you want to start looking at things that will raise funds, then you have another whole set of literature and propaganda, really, that's coming out of this period. And one of the good examples of this is to look at uh, some of the publications that were coming out of um, the leprosy mission and particularly this leprosy mission that is run by this, this guy, Pat Trimmey. If you look at these images, you have again a little bit of a colonial feeling coming through, um, but you have a connection between the emphasis on children everywhere and the emphasis on children in those slides. So the first thing I want to note, I'll just make a couple of points. One is that in this you have um, the patient is sort of the receiver of the goods. There's not, there's not the notion that, there's not, there's not the kind of notion you get now that you know by, by, by giving something it's going to make benefit you. It's very much a colonial model and very much of its time, the 1940s and 50s, that by giving something, you're going to benefit that person. And you can see in this image that the people who are giving are higher up, they're higher in status and in position in the image. They're giving gifts to, um, in this case, an islander boy. Um, and you can see all the different groups here waiting to receive gifts. And this is a Christmas campaign. So if be Father Christmas to our island, our island friends. And this was very much the theme of Toomey and the Lepers Trust Board. You can see the name of the organization here. Uh, Toomey representing himself as the leper man here. Very much the notion that you should give to our island friends. These are our friends. So it can't help having a bit of colonial dominance there, but the idea was to show a connection, a friendship, a relationship between the two. An important point that's represented here is that by giving gifts at Christmas time, you're going to free children from leprosy. It was a very strong theme. So in the, in the film that we saw, there's this sort of, you know, oh, there are children everywhere, it's so much fun, it's great to be on Muffin Life. From, from the Lepers Trust Board, the fact that children have leprosy was seen as an absolute tragedy. And it comes through in some of the publicity that they're using. This is out of the archives, so it's got things on it to hold it down while it's being photographed. So, but this is coming, giving a sense of how children were being used to 
really increase the power of the philanthropic um, feeling in New Zealand. So yes, children had a great time on, on Makumai. There were scout groups, they went to school, they had friends, they played games, but they still had a disease that was horrible. And here you have one of the cases where the disease is being, the horror of it's being used, it's being kind of deployed to show the importance of um, giving some funds and raising money. So it's being used as a fundraiser. It's an interesting, it's an interesting counterpoint. You've got an adult here shown with leprosy, but the idea is to save this child, stop the child getting it. And Toomey uses his own reputation to promote and, and encourage leprosy work. And he has actually written across this picture and it becomes part of the poster that's set up. And it's saying that <coughs> this child here actually did end up seeing her parents again. She did get cured because of all the treatment and the help and so on that she got. So children become drawn into a fundraising campaign, but again there's an effort to there's an effort to protect the child from, from this kind of representation. There's a separation between the representation of the child as innocent, as beautiful, and of the adult with leprosy. And this itself is a curious, um, you know, if you think about the sort of age things we see on TV today, many of them show children in a terrible condition. These, things, these are interesting images because there's a constant emphasis on um, protecting the child from stigmatization and protecting them from the damage of stigma. But also the important thing is the emphasis on um, connecting, making a personal connection between the New Zealanders and the leprosy patients of the Pacific. So this idea that we can do no more without your help. Um, we, 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 you know, the, the leprosy group, this is actually published in the newspapers so the ordinary newspapers in New Zealand would carry these sorts of images as a way of encouraging a response. During the time that it was an isolation centre, over 4,500 patients were treated on Makomai. And of these, more than 1,500 died and were buried on the island. So that the children and this returning home of people were seen as a great triumph great gift. Um, many people simply never recovered. And this is the graveyard. I saw this in 2010. And the patient register, which as part of the project we have developed into a database, shows, this is beginning with the first patient, number one, and it goes right through into the uh, several thousand. Now, this patient register revealed something quite uh, horrifying in some ways. Um, but it also, yeah, it, it links to this point about the children. The thing that happens is that if you look at the social and family connections between patients on Makamai, this is Indian patients, this is just one particular patient here, with the father and mother and uh, the connections that go, this patient is another one. What, what can be seen is that While the island tries to, while the people on the island, while the promotion, while the advertising is trying to normalise and remove the stigma of leprosy, remove the stigma of disability, in a, in a curious way, the island itself um, provides a context for whole families to be united in, um, in their experience of leprosy. And it's, they're, they're united in a context which allows them to be families and to um, live relatively normal lives, um, except that they can't live together. So it's a bit sort of broken up. But this, what this is showing is that these are the families that end up on the island. The father goes first and he's there for about 20 years, but gradually his wife comes, one of the children comes, people who know the family come, and you get this big crossover. So for these sections of time, you have several family members, several of their friends and associates, all on the island together. So, 
This process of disabling that um, involves curing, treating, uh, representing life on Makunga as normal, removing stigmatization of leprosy, all this is going on meanwhile families are being connected and brought to this isolation because they have the disease of leprosy. So there's a kind of intervention, a social intervention that's crossing all of these things. I hope I'm not confusing you too much. So when we look at the way leprosy is presented, the stereotypical representation of the leper is as this sort of unclean, unclean idea. Um, but as I've said, the Lepers Trust Board was trying to promote connection between people. And in the Leper Man appeals, they often centralise the Leper Man as a kind of focal point rather than emphasising the individual as being um, horrible or, or, or repulsive in any way. And the last few points I want to make is that the dominant theme, in addition to the emphasis on children, is that whatever happens, the social disability of leprosy needs to be disabled and disconnected. And here we have this kind of idea that um, you know the, these people are still there. We've helped them, but you need to help them again. We need to do it again, and we need to keep keep up that friendship, keep up a personal connection, and also focus on the image of this leper man as the sort of guarantor. By helping him, you're helping the people with leprosy. By helping the people with leprosy, um, you're forming a connection between ordinary New Zealand citizens and people with, uh, on the islands who have diseases. So this emphasis is on connection, personality, and friendship. And these are just, this is just one of the pamphlets that was used to promote the leprosy patients. And again, the emphasis here is on, on treatment here. Patients are um, rolling and unrolling bandages. On ordinary life, you have a choir, on active pursuits. And then on the back, there's text encouraging people to connect up. Newspapers also presented the idea that you should just give things to people on the island because it was a normal thing to do, that there was no reason to feel a separation, that there should be a connection between ordinary New Zealanders at Christmas time and people out on the islands who have leprosy. There shouldn't be a disjunction. And the newsreel from the leprosy station here uh, again, is representing the normalisation. This is the thing that really I want you to take home from this. The strong emphasis and promotion here on happy families. Um, here you have the child who's died there, but he's died a beautiful death. He has flowers, he's been respected. There's nothing of a horror, there's no um, throwing aside people who have illness here. It's a Christmas party for children. Uh, women's enjoying, um, women enjoying performances and, and cultural events and so on. So the strength of the representation throughout this whole campaign by the Lepers Trust Board and also by the sisters and so on, is on finding connection points between people with leprosy, isolated on this island, and the ordinary individuals in New Zealand. It's not on a stigmatization and a separation. And that's what makes this so interesting. And this is the last image I want to show you. Um, this is Paul Tele, one of my friends, Paulo and Wati Mariah. Both of these people have now died, but we, uh, they were kind enough to allow us to interview them. So we have uh, history, life history interviews from these people. Paulo, who had almost no hand, no, nothing left <coughs> of his hands, used to make these beautiful um, carvings and he showed me um, some of his carvings here and I have some. Samisi Maya became known in Fiji for his artistic skill and even internationally. Um, and one of the things that is intriguing about Samisi Maya is he gets kind of picked up uh, to show the link between disability and leprosy in 1981. But I want to show you this well, last to teach that is your friend that we know them in New Zealand. St. Elizabeth's home encourages its students in the creativity of indigenous arts, unfortunately often lost in the surge of civilization. With a growing tourist trade in Fiji, there's ample outlet for such works. Probably the most famous product to appear from this nucleus of creativity is Simisi Maya, a man who spent 
14 years of his life on that train. He is now like the others here, a discharged patient, although he is now a permanent resident. It was during his early rehabilitation training that it was found he had a unique artistic flair. The ability to use his crippled knuckles, the back of his wrist, and the hair on his forearm to paint landscape pictures has earned for him praise both in his homeland and overseas. This entire picture was painted in watercolors in just 59 seconds. Here, there is a New Zealand sister who assists him and frames his finished works. Like all artists, his works reflect his moods. He has had an opportunity that within the South Pacific, only Fiji offers. Much more has to be done in the rest of the Pacific area to give others the same opportunity. So what's, I don't know how much you could pick up of that, but what's extraordinary about that film is that the notion of the stigmatised leprosy patient who's profoundly stigmatised by his disabilities, you could see he had to hold his hand, he couldn't actually control his arm. The gap between that and the dominant now colonial type of discourse is huge. By the time that Samisi Meyer is being filmed here, he's a discharged patient. He's in the St. Elizabeth's home. This is after Makumai has closed. Uh, he's now living in Fiji in a kind of nursing home. But the emphasis in this is on the benefit, the opportunity that Samisi Meyer has experienced. He's experienced this because he was, at the, the implication is because he had leprosy. Um, and he's seen as a kind of a product, a product of um, an art and innovation movement, a product of an opportunity to gain indigenous skill and indigenous art and to prepare people to provide goods for a new tourist market. So he's represented as somebody who is, um, has been given an opportunity to become skilled as an artist, and therefore to contribute to Fiji's growing economy. I mean, this is a radical transformation from the notion of the person with leprosy as stigmatized and fearful, and, and also the person with disability as being fearful. So he becomes part of a, a kind of program of progress and the thing that really comes through this is the notion that um, his ability to draw, his ability to um, paint and provide an artistic activity is something that, as they say, have been, these are skills that were lost in the processes of civilization. So he's been able to sort of restore and revive artistic traditions because he's had the disease of leprosy, because he was disabled. So you have a complete transformation of the notion of leprosy as a stigmatized disease which isolates, isolates and excludes, which removes opportunities, which removes social engagement. A complete movement from that towards leprosy as being an opportunity to restore arts that have been lost due to civilization, and you've got rampant colonialism happening there, but also as an opportunity to allow Samisi Maya to be a citizen of Fiji in a full sense of the world word and to contribute to Fiji's economic growth and burgeoning. And the point is made that Fiji has these opportunities and they should be more throughout the Pacific. It's not Fiji, it was Makumai Island that gave him these opportunities. Um, and many of these people, Watam, Watam Mariah, who um, became a skilled seamstress on Makumai. She was taught how to do all kinds of patchwork and um, stitching and so on. Politele learned how to carve. And these were some of the gifts that, that became, they were intended to help people to have a constructive and productive life. But later, when the island is closed, um, they become part of a kind of colonial and increasingly post-colonial mantra about the civilization and about citizenship, I show you. It's more about citizenship. The people who had leprosy 
then have an opportunity to begin, become again useful citizens, to become reintegrated into their societies. So, the last point I want to make is that to just be aware that when we talk about languages of stigma, when we look at uh, representations, when we think discourses of exclusion, most of them are complicated by other factors. Um, in this case, you've got colonial and post-colonial factors. Um, you also usually will have indigenous versus uh, introduced ideas, you'll have economic factors, and you'll have social and cultural elements, all kind of mixing in to create or destabilize stigma. Okay, I'll stop, leave it there, and um, invite you to ask questions when you're ready. Thank you uh, very much for the, for the very interesting uh, presentation and uh, it reminded me a lot of uh, all the images that we see on a daily basis. I mean, if we turn on the television, uh, if we put on the computer and if we are confronted with the images of children from Haiti, uh, from uh, the United States of America when the hurricane uh, came about. I mean couple of processes that you uh, presented to us, they are still active today and I think it is very important to take that with you uh, when you again turn on the television and when you again are confronted with those kind of images. I think that is very important to uh, keep in mind. I mean, we are continuously being educated by images. They steer our behavior. They try to make us do and think particular things. And I think it is important to, uh, as intellectuals, as educators, to relate ourselves to those educational messages that are contained in the images. So uh, that is just a, a way to approach the presentation and also to connect it maybe a bit more to uh, present day issues. Uh, maybe just to, to kick off uh, the question uh, round, uh, I have one uh, myself. and. Uh, uh, that will not come as a surprise, uh, probably. <laughs> uh, I was struck by one of the posters uh, which said, okay, so we had a, a child, and the text went as follows, I'm innocent, yeah. I'm young, and I'm beautiful. And if you paid attention to what I said in class, I mean, you easily can connect that with the emergence, the discovery, of the child in Western history. Uh, all of a sudden, the child becomes innocent. And so my question now is, is that the influence of a European tradition or something? Or did the original people that lived on the Fiji Islands already looked at the children like that? So that's a question that came to my mind. And I'm not sure whether you can respond to that. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, really, what you're seeing in this image is very much a Western Christian representation. Um, it's a European model, and the idea of the, yeah, the birth of innocence is something. You know, the innocence of the child is actually a very recent phenomenon in Western culture. Um, the, the islanders had different traditions when it came to leprosy and it came to disability. The Fijian traditions were quite brutal. It was quite common for people to be clubbed to death in Fiji when they were discovered to have leprosy. Um, in some of the other islands, the, you know, one of the things that made Makumai so important, especially for children, was that once they were diagnosed, they were typically isolated within their own cultures. So their own villages, for example, the child would be left out on the outskirts of the village, or an adult. But, but often it's children who had the disease discovered at the age of seven or eight. Um, one of the people that we interviewed had lived as a little child in the medical officer's hut, which was miles away from her home, for two years. Can you imagine being a nine-year-old child living in a room with nothing to do, nothing to play with, no stimulus, no friends? Her father moved with her and stayed 
another mile away and would come and visit her during the day and then went home to sleep in his own place. But he couldn't touch her, he couldn't have any interaction with her. I mean, in terms of trauma, <laughs> that was far worse. In terms of developmental delay and in terms of your, your education, she no longer went to school, she had nothing to do, she simply existed. It's a bit like being in solitary confinement. <coughs> So when that child, when the boat came round and picked her up and took her to Marquardt <coughs> Island, she said for her, she was terrified because she assumed that she would die, because that was the expectation that would die on the island. But actually she said, when I went there, there were all these other children there, I went back to school, uh, I could play, I had friends, I joined the Girl Guides, you know, the, they had music events, they had film showings. It was a completely different world. And the nuns looked after them because they adored them. So the treatment of children in the island cultures was quite tough. Um, and the notion of the child as innocent and beautiful and needing care and help is something that was a really very recent um, European development. I mean, you know, the factories were full of children in the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the children weren't seen in that sense at all at that point. So it's quite a recent development, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other questions from uh, you? Uh, yeah. The, uh, Professor Buckingham, uh, thank you very much for a very wonderful lecture. I thought it was interesting not only from an edu educational perspective but also an anthropological one. Um, I would like to know more about uh, actually Samisi's work and do you consider it as a, also a good form of self-representation or are there other examples about on how the community represented itself, for instance through theatre, music, yeah. to contrast a little bit with uh, the other images? Yeah. Thanks, that's a brilliant question. Um, one of the things I didn't show a lot of was um, photographs. It, it's one of those curious things where the representation of the self, of the communities, their own self, their own artistry is still through a European lens because the photographs are taken by outsiders. Um, Samisi so Maya is a fan fascinating person because he, he suffered from terrible depressions, understandably. Um, and his art really reflects it. You can see different paintings. Some of them are very dark, like the one he did on that. Some are beautiful, bright uh, images. And Samisi Maya, um, most of these people who had leprosy, had, they had opportunities to express themselves to the, in the outside world, sort of to an outside community. But much of their artistic expression and cultural expression was within the island itself. So that, so that people, um, they, did, they had their own cultural performances and their own, um, the guys used to sit around the kava, which is a, it's not like beer, but it's a, um, you know, it's a, you get, basically you get pretty stoned on kava, right? So kava, which is a drink that the uh, Fijians in particular, the Fijians would drink. That was that came every that was came over every day from Suva, uh, so from Fiji for them. So most of the cultural experience and, and community representation would happen within those small private moments. So that you know the guys would say, I mean, and we know from the not Paul Tele, but his friend um, Suka used to talk to us about uh, how they'd have a kava session every evening. So they'd sit and they'd sing and they'd tell stories and get very mellow. So there was that kind of private self-representation, private creation of community, private um, work through work, men, men and women both through the labour they did, through growing plants, through being able to provide for each other. <coughs> These ways of representation were, were part of expressing who they were within the island community. But there were also other connection. So Samisi Maya, I mean he was an artist. There's some beautiful art and crafts and sculptures that come out of this place. Um, and I've seen quite a lot of them. I mean 
there's a, there's a, some of them are religious figures, some of them are island cultural figures. Um, and so there was a sort of personal expression of artistry that would happen in the workshop. But then there was also another extension of that. There was a point where um, Fiji had a big exhibition and it was one of the points of connection between the Fijian world and the Europeans and the patients from Makamai. And uh, Makamai sent represented, they couldn't, the patients couldn't go, but their art and their creations went and were displayed. And there's a huge, you know, they always said they were just so happy to see that their art was being represented in that wider world. And this did a lot to help break down barriers. Because, you know, the ships that brought these people were completely decontaminated afterwards. I mean, the fact that someone would actually touch something that had come from this island <coughs> was a huge thing. These are huge steps in de destigmatizing, de kind of destabling that isolation. I don't know if that quite answers your question, but there are a lot of pri I think the thing is that there's a lot of private art, private artistry, and if you go and hang out somewhere in the, you know, I've been to Mark Mai, the chiefs, there's one little village still there, the chiefs, you know, you sit, the first thing you do is you have a carving ceremony. And that, that's a kind of, it's kind of a getting to know you thing, but it's also um, where people express themselves, they sing, the music, uh, dance, it's a, um, yeah, it's a kind of, it, not it's not for public consumption. You're all very restless, you lot. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, I have two more uh, questions, actually. Uh, so the first one uh, is what about the heritage of everything that went on mm -hmm. on the Fiji Islands? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it preserved? Uh, do they put up projects in order to make it accessible to a wide audience or something like that? I mean, are there any intentions yeah. played well, with in order to do so? Yeah. So that would be my first question. Can and then the second question is, of course, uh, you, you can have images uh, which contain educational messages. But the other side of the story is, of course, are these messages realized? I mean, what about the effect, the impact that they had uh, on the wider public in New Zealand? Uh, what about the impact that they had on the people in leprosy themselves? I mean, that is education, isn't it? Uh, you have someone uh, that tries to distribute the message. Uh, in this case, it's a message. And then we are confronted with those images. Uh, the guys who lived at New Zealand in the 50s and 60s, they saw those those images in the newspaper. And so I am wondering, is there any research available that can give us an insight into how the general public reacted uh, towards those images? So I think that is also important to uh, get a better grip on uh, in order to think about the educational impact uh, of, those, of those images. Start with the first one. Okay. So the, the, the two beautiful questions. And the first one is a very interesting thing. I'll just sit down for a second. <laughs> the first one's a very interesting one, particularly if you've been, I don't know how many of you have been to see the Damien crypt. Have you seen it? Okay, so it's, it's just up the road. <laughs> so you should go and have a look at that because there you have a, an effort to represent and preserve some of the history of leprosy on a different island called Molokai in Hawaii. And I've been to Molokai, and there they're doing amazing preservation work. They have the old hospital, they're preserving the old hospital grounds, they have the equipment that was used, they have the old autopsy tables, um, the archive is being preserved in these beautiful uh, temperature controlled environments. Uh, it's going to end up as a kind of living or a kind of village settlement in, me in memory. Makamai is completely different. Firstly, no one's ever heard of it. So, in the West anyway, Father Damien and Molokai and Hawaii are known, but not Makamai. The island is, what well, you could see, it was um, uh, 
um, everything is completely overgrown. So this is the jungle, really. Oops. The jungle is... Uh, so the jungle is just reclaiming the ruins that are there. And there are a lot of pictures I didn't show you, but, but basically it's all ruins. And you go and you find, you know, the old kitchen or the remnant of the hut here. Or there was a little jail on the island for people who got out of control. Um, but it's got plants and everything. The jungle's just coming back. Um, and there's very little left, actually, and there's no effort to preserve it whatsoever. Um, and the main archival collection is this Pacific Leprosy Foundation material, which is that Toomey and all that record, which is held at the University of Canterbury, where I am. And, and that's where the preservations come in, and the oral histories that we did, because otherwise there would be nothing, nothing. So there's no effort there at all. Um, and the other point is a really, really important one that, you know, we can talk about images and representation and we can talk about people's experience of, you know, the sort of, you know, the way people were represented at different times, but how is that communicated then to the people who are looking at that image? There, there may be an intention behind that image, but how is the image received and how is it understood and internalised? Does it change people's behaviour? Well, what we can say about this stuff is that these images, um, the, leper, the leper man appeals, particularly the Christmas appeals, we can say that they were successful. Uh, those appeals, leprosy care in the Pacific is still funded entirely by this particular organisation. And this organisation is entirely funded by donations from ordinary New Zealanders. And that's quite extraordinary. If you read the archive from the 1940s and 50s, you find it's sort of, you, you don't know, but it'd be like, it'd be like having somebody in a, in a small rural village out in, you know, the outskirts, out, way out of there, the, 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 the mother in the house writing and saying, you know, I've sent my one pound or whatever. Um, every year, people spent, sent money, and often there were pensioners who sent them. Often old people, there's all these letters, as you can see. Um, you can see that there was a huge response, not just in the churches where there were collection boxes put out, but, but the response was a set of very personal. There was a sense that there was a, a personal connection. And um, the, I've done a paper using one of these files in the archive, which is all the complaints. Um, and the complaints, talk about, you know, they say, you know, I'm, I'm very sorry, Mr. Toomey, I can only send you this much this year because my mother's sick and I have to look after her. It was that level of personal connection that was coming through. So, yeah, it worked. And it has worked. Um, and now leprosy since 1985, it's, it's treatable with multi-drug therapy, so, you know, it's not so much of a big issue. But, yeah, a huge impact. And, and people will often say now, they go, oh yeah, I remember the leper man, and you know, I remember that. So it's part of the psyche of, Christ, of New Zealand and of Christchurch in particular. Any more questions? You're very quiet people. Okay, great.
going to try to translate it uh, as good as uh, I can. Maybe it's good to, to present uh, the person uh, who posed the question. It's uh, Honoré Vink. Uh, he is a scientific collaborator of our research unit, and he has a, a huge history with uh, colonial uh, Congo. Uh, he worked uh, in the Congo himself for many, many years. And actually, he worked in a leprosy settlement uh, for some time in Congo. And so his question is that, on the basis of his experiences, uh, where people, uh, persons with leprosy, uh, they kind of uh, celebrated the fact that they were healed, they were cured, and then there were big facilities being set up in order to uh, say goodbye to them, if, if that is correct. Uh, and so the question is, do these kind of things also happen uh, on the Fiji Islands? Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> well, the really short answer is I don't know. Um, the, it, it's a very interesting, I have, it, it says something that of all the 30 interviews we did, so we interviewed 30 people, not one of them mentioned a celebration relating to here. Not one. Um, it could be because the process was so slow. Um, people were only allowed to leave the island after they'd been shown for two years to have clear skin cells. So it was two, year, two years before they were allowed to leave. And the pattern I showed you, which was that quite often you had families that are partly on the island as well. So that I mean, they were happy. I mean, if people would say, you know, that they were very happy when they could go home. But they never mentioned the big festivity. And that's one of the things that's quite striking of, of all the interviews that we did, which included people who, who got healed and were able to come home. Um, not one mentioned the festivity. Um, but they did say that, you know, in one case they said, you know, the family was so happy that they could come home so they actually travel to meet them and stay with them. But it's, it's actually something that has never been mentioned, which is quite interesting. What we do hear was how sad they were to leave. Um, and some of these people remained uh, within the care of this sort of group even after um, they think they were discharged. I mean, they're clear of the disease. But they never got home because their family, they don't feel comfortable. So it's actually, I think, quite ambivalent. And, and what is strike, what you say is very intriguing because there's no, nothing in what we have heard, and no photographs either, that show a celebration when someone is leaving. Not nothing. I'll ask, I'll ask again. <coughs> Really interesting. It says something about the way the island is. There's a lot of nostalgia for the island. And I think often when they did leave, they were leaving their families behind because they were still on the island. So it's quite a common. It's a, it's a very big difference. It's a really big difference. Is it okay? Yeah. Thanks. Maybe. I, I have a question for you. Uh, you are all very quiet, and so my question would be: uh, Are you acquainted with uh, the Damian Papsi? Who knows the Damian Papsi? Raise your hand. Okay. So the Damian Papsi is a, an organization that also uh, raises funds here in uh, Belgium. It's a similar organization. Yeah. And so, who knows uh, the symbol of the Damian Papsi? Yeah. It's a butterfly. It is a butterfly. So I think it's also interesting to connect uh, the symbolic choice for a butterfly with uh, what uh, Professor Buckingham just uh, told us. I think also there you can see issues of, of rehabilitation, of, of hope uh, coming up and being attached to uh, the person who suffers from, from leprosy. Uh, the Damiana, they focus on uh, 
Democratic Republic of Congo and some other countries in Asia and uh, Africa. And so I think it's interesting just as an exercise to have a look at the website of the Damiana team. If you go home and try to connect as much of the things you hear you heard today to the movies that are being shown on the website of the Damiana team in order to see whether the politics of imaginary, which we just discussed, still are active today. I think that is a really important and interesting uh, question. Uh, so that was just uh, my question and a remark uh, from myself. But you can take it up or leave it uh, just to solve. That's up to you. Yeah, so an outside space is the seat of the Okay. Uh, so this kind of uh, goodbye facility, uh, you can see on a movie that was made uh, in 1958, and the title of the movie, and we have a we have a digital copy of it. Uh, it's Marie Lalé. Uh, so we can uh, we can show it. Okay, so the last word is to you. Any other pressing question you would like to pose to Professor Buckingham? Now it's the time because uh, after tomorrow she will be flying back to New Zealand and then it's very difficult to reach her or you would have to <laughs> travel uh, for more than 40 hours. Anyone? So I would like to thanks to thank uh, Professor Turkey and for the wonderful speech and for all those who uh, are planning to attend one of the movies. We'll see each other somewhere this week. Thanks for coming. I checked it out.